Chapter 10 Colby here. Colby answered the phone. It's Drew. Drew gently rocked Minnie Miguel in his car seat as he talked on the phone and waited for the loads of laundry to be done. Any updates? Colby sighed. I checked out the pharmacy. It was an old mom-and-pop operation. No cameras. Drew closed his eyes in disappointment. He had been hoping they would get lucky and find Ted Searson getting prescriptions filled for his daughter. Didn't say that, Colby informed him. They do have cameras. Problem is, I just combed through days of recordings just to find out that they have missed about an hour. The owners claim it was a glitch, but I'm guessing that's when somebody filled out those prescriptions. That means Dr. Ershman is likely telling the truth. Drew tried not to let his anger build. It was working during the missing recording time. An employee, revealed Colby. One pharmacy technician, Jolene Carmody. I flirted and plied on the charm, but she's a tough cookie. Told me to get a warrant before she'll give up her records on who picked up the meds. What did Green say to getting a judge to get the warrant? Drew hoped their boss was in a better mood than when he had seen him last time. He gave the go-ahead. Now I'm waiting on the paperwork, Colby responded. You're the man, Colby. Drew was relieved. Finally, maybe they could get this thing squared away and nail Ted Searson. You know it, Colby replied. I'll let you know how it goes when I've got the warrant. Thanks. Drew ended the call. He quickly dialed Fenton's number. Hey, Fenton, is Ted Searson showing any signs of cracking? Drew, always a pleasure, Fenton said wryly. I'm at the kids' game. Nice. Terry going to score? Drew knew Terry was in soccer. He also knew Fenton had dreams of his kid going to play professional some day. Considering Terry was only eight, he had a long way to go. I hope so. Fenton yelled out something not very nice to the referee. Guy is blind. I know it is family time, and you do not like talking shop during family time, but Fenton, I gotta know. Is Searson going to roll on his pal Ramsley? Questioned Drew. Fenton sighed. You're not going to let me just enjoy the game, are you? Nope, Drew happily replied. Fine, growled Fenton. That was not offside! Ted Searson, Drew reminded him. He lawyered up pretty big. Will not talk to anyone without his attorney present. I think Ramsley used the same guy, so I'm betting Searson is not going to confess or accuse anyone particular of anything anytime soon, Fenton informed him. Crud, sighed Drew. That's one way of putting it. Look, I have to go, Fenton yelled again at the refs. Drew decided that he would never be that sort of dad if he ever had kids. Thanks, Fenton. The call disconnected and Drew looked down at his nephew. What do you think? Minnie Miguel just cooed at him. You are about as much help as your dad, commented Drew. While Miguel was one of his best friends, it was still fun to pick on him. Drew looked over at the pile of papers left out on a folding table. Right on top was another tabloid article by Sterling Denver. FBI arrests David Ramsley. He picked up the pages and perused the article. David Ramsley, head of the prestigious Ramsley clan, has been arrested by the FBI today in a long-reaching case involving drug smuggling, money laundering, and embezzlement. Also arrested were Robert Ramsley, brother of David, and Ted Searson, a longtime friend of the family. Ted Searson was facing charges of attempted murder of his daughter, Bethany Searson, noted member of the city orchestra, but the FBI have pulled rank and taken custody of Searson. Drew growled. Fenton had not told him that. Then again, maybe he did not know it yet if it only happened today and Fenton was off. This meant that any chances of getting Ted to confess to David's part of the attempted murder scheme had gone, since they would have zero access to Searson. The only good news seemed to be that David was on his way to prison anyways. Drew hoped Law had built a good case. He would hate for the old man to get out. Drew looked at the photos and took a deep breath. He clenched his teeth. There was Max, a repeat photo of him at his wedding a few years ago. There was also a picture of Drew with Bethany, taken right as they were leaving the hospital, his hand on her back as he escorted her to his truck. Not Max Ramsley after all. All those recent sightings during Max Ramsley's disappearance were wrong. This is Andrew Colburn Ramsley, son of David Ramsley and Margaret Colburn, 
with Bethany Searson, recently released from hospital after her own father tried to kill her. David had an affair on wife Rachel. Margaret Colburn tells all the dirty family secrets, a hidden love, illegitimate children, and how her son Drew is deeply in love with Beth, who was once briefly engaged to Noah Ramsley, his half-brother. Drew skimmed over his mother's tirade of how David would have left Rachel for her if he only had been able to. Sterling Denver managed to spin the story quite well, probably with his mother's full cooperation. There were childhood photos of Jana, Drew, and Molson splashed across the page. He felt a rush of anger at the intrusion into their lives. None of them had asked for this. If anything, they did not want to be associated with the Ramsleys. They did just fine on their own without the Ramsleys and their wealth. The tabloid laid out Jana's marriage to Miguel, the names and ages of their three children, how Jana, Miguel, and Drew were all police officers. It also briefly dipped into Molson, who was working at a local auto shop. It was a chop shop, only no one had been able to find anything illegal going on there. Drew had no doubts there was illegal activity at the small shop. When he had questioned Molson about it, his brother had just given him a knowing smile and told him it was better if he did not know. Drew wanted to curse. He wanted to yell at Sterling Denver and ask her how she would like it if she had her entire backstory told to the world at large. Margaret insists son Drew is in love with Beth. It looks like she's right as the police detective is now living with society's darling girl. After years of dating the finest bachelors, it looks like poor little rich girl is going for a bad boy, complete with a Harley and a former career as an undercover officer, ferreting out the city's worst criminals by living amongst them. The relationship has been quietly under wraps for a while, but city orchestra member Reginald Wells and friend of Beth knew the couple's status. He claims they have been dating for at least a month. Will this fairy tale have a happy ending? Someone needed to give Sterling Denver a taste of her own medicine. Drew tossed the paper into Janet's laundry basket. He would take it back upstairs. Unfortunately, Bethany would have to know about this. Dating for a month? They had not even known each other that long. Drew could not deny that he had feelings for her. That part was true. However, there was no way that the tabloid reporter could be aware of that. How she found out that Bethany was staying with Drew was a surprise. Sterling should be on the police force with her investigative abilities. Someone was bound to show Green the papers. That meant that he would soon know that Bethany was in Drew's apartment. It was not going to go over well. Then again, Drew was not working. He was off the case, right? Drew could do whatever he wanted with his time off. At least, that was what Drew was going to say in his defense when Green booted Drew back to foot patrol. Baby Miguel gave a cry, annoyed at being ignored. Drew gave the car seat a nudge so it would rock again. We are in a fine mess, little buddy. Drew lugged the baby and his laundry back to his apartment. He had already dropped off Jana's laundry in her apartment since it was close to the building's laundry room. Jana was showing Bethany something in the kitchen. Drew left the basket of laundry on the kitchen table. He would deal with it later. He propped Miguel Jr. on the table as well. The baby was sleeping in the car seat. You didn't have him in the car seat the whole time, did you? questioned Jana. No, Drew responded patiently. I took him out, and we talked about how his mama liked to boss us around while the dryers were doing their thing. What are you two up to? Jana is teaching me how to make chili, Bethany said lightly. Drew loved Jana's chili. He had no idea how to make it, because she would never share the recipe. Drew looked at his sister in surprise. You are teaching her how to make your chili, but you won't share the recipe with me. I like her, Jana said sweetly. Jana had never taught any of his other girlfriends how to make chili. Then again, Bethany was not his girlfriend. Of course, Jana had not much liked any of the other girls he had introduced her to. It's nice of Jana to teach me, Bethany said happily. I enjoy cooking, and she offered to teach me a few things. A woman who enjoyed cooking and cheered for the Yankees. They did not make many of them that way anymore. That is nice of her. Where did you find the ingredients? I thought we were pretty empty on food. We borrowed from my place. Jana smiled smugly. Drew wondered what she was up to. He did not think for one minute that this was being done out of the kindness of her heart. 
In response to her happy smile, Drew offered her the tabloid paper, turned already to the inside article. Is that a picture of my wedding? Jana hissed. Yep. Drew did not think Margaret had any more recent photos, so this was probably the best that Sterling Denver had been able to come up with. Jana actually growled. For the first time since seeing the article, Drew was tempted to smile. What is going on? Bethany turned down the chili and leaned over Jana's shoulder to have a look. The threatening smile left quickly. Drew handed Bethany a reputable paper to give her the details. He did not really want her to look at the tabloid with all its seedy glory. The FBI has arrested David Ramsley and Ted Searson for drug smuggling and a few other charges. Bethany took the paper, a frown puckering her brows as she read. This is... Jana glared at the paper. Why would she give an interview with a tabloid reporter? She is our mother, Drew said dryly. Knowing wacko Margot, she probably enjoyed the attention. Molson should have kept her in line, huffed Jana. He should never have let her talk to a reporter. He probably was not there. He does pretend to work on occasion, sighed Drew. Not even sure if he was still living with her or not. Wait, Bethany looked at them. This validates everything I've been saying. About the boat, sweet Bethany? About my memories? Yes, it does. Drew was sorry he had ever doubted her. You were right all along. I was not crazy. Bethany blinked back tears. Every time he told me it was all in my mind, it was not. Every time he made me feel silly and stupid, it was because he was covering their tracks. He made me feel like a child who did not know anything at all. He had me drugged and undergoing therapy for years to protect himself. Bethany threw down the paper, hugging herself. I am so angry at him. Jana nodded girl did possess a backbone after all. Bethany would need it if she decided to be with Drew. I like her. Don't screw this up, Drew. Drew looked a little uncertainly at the sweet woman in front of him who was blazing angry right now. This was a new side of Bethany. Thanks for the confidence boost, Jana. Can I punch something? wondered Bethany with a frown. I feel like punching something. Sure, Jana said easily. Punch my brother. Drew gave his sister a dirty look. There is an exercise room downstairs. It has a punching bag. Bethany nodded. You will have to teach me how. You want to learn how to punch, Drew asked, trying to mask his amusement. I want to learn everything when it comes to self-defense. I also want to beat the stuffing out of something for the way my father has been treating me all these years, Bethany said firmly. She was adorable when she pouted. Then let's beat the stuffing out of a punching bag. Drew held out a hand and did not even look at Jana as he led Bethany out of the apartment. He did not care what his sister thought of his actions. A couple of hours later, Drew and Bethany returned to the apartment. The chili was warm on the stove. There was a receipt and a note on the table. You owe me. Keep her. Drew crumpled it up quickly. What did it say? Bethany asked as she picked up the tabloid. She was tired after working through her anger. Drew had been very helpful in showing her how to properly throw a punch so that she would not hurt herself. That I owe her money for the food? Drew shrugged. She likes you. I like her. Bethany looked at him for a moment. She said you could get into trouble for letting me stay here with you. Let me worry about that, Drew said firmly. Are you certain? questioned Bethany. Yes. Drew grabbed a couple of bowls and started setting the table. Now, more importantly, what do you like to drink with your chili? Bethany smiled. I'm not sure since I've never had chili. Seriously? Drew paused in surprise. You've never had chili? No. Bethany returned her attention to the paper. It was not considered cordon bleu cooking. The chef at home never made it. You employed a chef? Drew asked in astonishment as he grabbed a couple of glasses and cutlery. My parents did. I learned to cook in college, Bethany murmured. She blushed as she read the article. Oh, my. Yeah, Drew said darkly. Sterling Silver has done herself like always. Who? Bethany turned a slightly darker shade of pink as she looked up. The writer. What is it? Drew wondered what was bothering her so much. Bethany hesitated. I have a confession to make. I never thought Reggie would say something like this. You know the guy? 
Drew searched his mind to remember what the quote was that Sterling had used. He is a fellow violinist at the orchestra. Bethany looked down at the paper, embarrassed. He kept asking me out, and I was trying to be polite. Drew carefully took the paper away from her. He patiently waited for her to look at him and continue. Bethany took a deep breath and raised her gaze to his. I might have led him to believe that you were my boyfriend? Really? Drew raised an eyebrow. For some reason, the simple statement made him very happy. Not that he was going to show that. I know it is juvenile, lamented Bethany. As soon as the words were out, I regretted them. I should have just told Reggie that I do not find him attractive, and I would prefer that he turn his charms somewhere else. However, once it was done, I just let him believe it. Any reason you chose me? Drew's ego felt a little boost. Maybe she did find him attractive after all. You were the first name that came to mind. She blushed a little deeper and felt like her face was on fire. I apologize. I had no right to do so. Any time you need a fictional boyfriend, let me know, Drew offered. He kind of liked that he had been the first to come to her mind in that sort of situation. I'm going to take a shower, Bethany mumbled. She had the feeling Drew was a little amused at her expense. While it probably was funny, right now she was too embarrassed. Bethany made her escape. Even though she hated taking showers, right now it was preferable than talking to her fictional boyfriend, Drew. Drew lay on the couch, one arm over his head, the other on his chest. A spring was poking him in the back, but he did not bother moving. Bethany was sleeping in the bed. They both had enjoyed supper and a night of chatting while watching the Yankees win. He tried not to let a goofy smile settle on his face. She liked him. She was not ready to admit it, but she liked him. If Drew did not watch it, he was going to end up like Max, besotted with her and Goofy. Somehow, his half-brother had been right. Once love hit you, bam, game over. They hardly knew each other, had met only such a short time ago. Yet Drew knew that no one would ever match up to Bethany in his life. He liked her. He wanted her. He loved her. It would never work. She would leave. That didn't mean that he was not going to enjoy wherever she chose to take this. Drew firmly believed in treating her like a lady. He would not take advantage of the situation, but he would happily let her stay if she wanted, share in her company as long as she was willing to. He stared up at the ceiling, unable to sleep. He felt restless. A distressed sound from the bed pulled his attention toward Bethany. Drew stilled as he tried to listen. There it was again. Bethany thrashed against the covers. Drew flipped off the afghan and padded over to the bed. Beth? She was making little choking noises. He flipped on the lamp and shook her shoulder. Bethany? Bethany woke with a gasp. She trembled and looked at him. Drew? I am right here. Drew sat on the edge of the bed, pushing her hair out of her face. It was just a dream. Bethany sighed and wiped a tear away. I thought once I knew what had happened that the nightmares would go away. You have been dreaming them for years, Drew said reasonably. It might take a while for them to stop. Will you stay? Bethany asked tentatively. I'm not going anywhere, promised Drew. No, Bethany sighed, a little embarrassed, but determined. She pulled back the blankets. I mean, will you stay the night with me? You make me feel safe, please? Do you want the light left on? he asked. Off is fine. Bethany had a relieved smile, not afraid of the dark. Drew shut off the lamp and carefully crawled into bed with her, drawing the covers up over both of them. There was only one pillow, but Bethany snuggled up to him, using him as a headrest, so it was not a problem. He rubbed her back as she settled in. Yep, game over for sure. Drew tried not to think about how much it was going to hurt when she left. If you enjoyed this chapter of Love and Lies, Book 5 of the Ramsley Brothers series, perhaps you'll enjoy Chapter 11. Look for it here on YouTube. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel to find great tips about writing, more audiobooks, and fun sneak peeks into future writings. Happy listening!